Good evening. Welcome to New School. My name is Karen Kooni. I'm the director of the Viralist Center for Art and Politics and delighted to present to you tonight the panel who builds your architecture, sustainability and sustaining human life, or as we like to call it, WBYA 2.0. Tonight's panel marks another instance of an ongoing public research project on ethics and architecture. Inspired by similar questions raised within a segment, a small segment of the art world, this particular series was initiated by Kadambara Bashi, Beth Stryker, Mabel Wilson, and the VLC. And I can't think of a more salient question that cuts to the essence of civic responsibility, whether in the role of maker, client, or user, whether in built environments that are local or distant, or in between, the question of who actually builds the spaces that we inhabit. WBYA has had a number of iterations, the first being a public program here in this space, um, presented just about a year ago, that specifically addressed the responsibility of architects for the working conditions in which their buildings are being constructed. Workshops, roundtables, and a strategy session followed, some in collaboration with the Architectural League of New York. Tonight, we're framing the question, who builds your architecture, not exclusively in terms of the ethics of labor, but in terms of a broader debate on sustainability more than a token nod to Earth Day, which is today, and informed by Ryder and Lou's notion of the, quote, sustainability of workers' rights, it is a call for a comprehensive consideration of sustainability that encompasses air, water, ground, but also the people living, working, and constructing these buildings in which we live. Architecture is a complex system of relationships professionalized, codified, regulated, and not. And at times, we'll be drawing parallels and look at convergences with other practices, the curatorial being one of them. I want to thank Kadam Barabashi, Beth Stryker, and Mabel Wilson very much for initiating this long-term project. I also want to acknowledge the support of Jordan Carver, who is um, also coming from uh, GSAP to us, and who joined the project last fall. I'm very pleased to welcome back to tonight's panel speakers from the panel a year ago, Peggy Diemer, Reinhold Martin, who will act as the moderator, and Andrew Ross. Andrew. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. And then we have um, a new um, group of speakers, Philip Bernstein, Edward Mayer, Walid Rod, Brad Samuels, William Sharples, Raphael Spurry, Smita Srinivas, and Nisha Variata. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here. Hi, uh, I'm Jordan Carver. Um, I'd like to welcome you as well um, in a kind of very similar language that Karen did. Um, but thank you for joining us for Who Builds Your Architecture To? Sustainability and Sustaining Human Life. So this marks the second public event where architects, human rights activists, planners, and artists gather to discuss the relationship of architects narrowly and creative and allied fields more broadly to the workers who execute their drawings, construct their projects, and realize the, their ideas in construction sites across the globe. In June 2010, Gulf Labor was launched as, quote, a coalition of international artists working to ensure that migrant workers Worker rights are protected during the construction and maintenance of museums on Saadiyat Island in Abu Dhabi, UAE. And tonight we're very lucky to have Walid Rod, one of the founding members, here to update us on their efforts. A glaring absence in Gulf Labor's coalition was an architectural voice, any architectural voice. While it is not surprising that the architects whose projects are under scrutiny did not rush to join the coalition, the lack of representation from the architectural field highlighted the professional and structural barriers that architects face in dealing with issues that, at least in theory, should be within their purview. In an attempt to fill this absence, uh, WBYA was founded. WYA, WBYA encompasses an emerging coalition of practitioners formed by Katambari Bachi, Beth Stryker, Mabel Wilson, and myself. We've been organizing events, starting discussion, have recently launched a website, uh, this website, uh, www.whobuilds.org, to tackle the pressing and difficult question, who builds your architecture? 
The first WBYA event uh, held one year ago was backgrounded by the reports of adverse and coercive labor practices at the Foxconn factories in China where Apple manufactures the ubiquitous iPhone. In February of this year, we held a meeting at the Architectural League of New York where a small group, including some of the participants here tonight, discussed issues of labor in relation to the practice, professional ethics, and discourse of architecture. The title of tonight's event uh, is Sustainability and Sustaining Human Life. We use the word sustainability both rhetorically and tactically. Can or maybe should uh, the definition of sustainability be reconceived beyond its, beyond its simplification into lead points and so-called green design? How can the criteria for sustainability be more broadly applied so as to encompass the conditions of its construction and the lives who construct it? One of the goals of tonight's discussion is to move beyond an agreed upon consensus of the problems surrounding architecture and labor and to, dis and to start to think about realistic ways that the profession and individual architects, educators, and students can formulate solutions to the problems of labor exploitation. Um, before introducing our guests, uh, we, um, WBYA, would like to uh, extend a very sincere thank you to Karen Coney and her team at the Vera List Center for their guidance and collaboration. We also want to thank the New School for hosting us, and especially Naomi Miller, uh, who's somewhere uh, around here, um, who put in a tremendous effort to bring this room and this event together. So thank you. Uh, and with that, I'd like to very quickly introduce our guests. Uh, for more detailed biographies, please refer to the uh, brochure that was um, being handed outside. The speakers are loosely paired together and will briefly present his or her response to tonight's theme with follow-up questions from our moderator. Um, moving from left to right, we have uh, Visha Naraya, who is a Middle East researcher at Human Rights Watch, uh, an organization whose research has been really integral to our conversations. Um, and not sitting here, but over on the far end, is Walid Rod, an interna internationally renowned artist and founding member of the Gulf Labor Coalition. Uh, Phil Bernstein is the vice president of Autodesk, and with Peggy Deemer edited Building the Future, Recasting Labor and Architecture, a collection of essays on labor practices, collaboration, and technology, also a book that has served an important inspiration to this project. Uh, Brad Samuels is a founder of C2 Studio, a design and fabrication firm in Brooklyn. Ed Mayer is a managing director of FX Fell Architects, working on projects in Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, William Sharples is a principal of Shop Architects uh, and a faculty member at Yale University. Uh, joining us from a pre-recorded video response is Raphael Sperry, an architect, activist, and educator in San Francisco. Raphael directs the Alternatives to Incarceration Prison Design Boycott Campaign, a project of architects, designers, planners for social responsibility. Smita Srinivas is an assistant professor of urban planning at Columbia GSAP and the director of the Technological Change Lab. Uh, the aforementioned Peggy Deemer is the founder of Deemer Studio and a professor at Yale University, and she will be um, providing responses to tonight's questions and presentations. And finally, uh, our exceptional moderator, Reinhold Martin. Reinhold is a professor of Columbia University GSAP, uh, where he is the director of the PhD program and the Temple Hoyne uh, Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture. Uh, he's been an important, enthusiastic presence uh, in all of our events. And we thank all of our panelists and Reinhold. Thank you. Well, first of all, I would just really like to thank all of you for being here today. It always encourages me to see when people are interested in thinking about what we can do to address abuse and exploitation of migrant workers in the Gulf. Um, I've worked with Human Rights Watch for the last 10 years, and a good part of that time has been investigating abuses against migrant workers, um, including in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. A lot of my colleagues have done the work on uh, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Qatar. But um, what I wanted to do, um, I thought, as the, as the first speaker, is maybe just set out what it is that we're talking about and why it is so important. And um, maybe in the question and answer session, get a little bit more to, to strategies. But first of all, I just wanted to know, of those of you in the audience, how many of you have been through Dubai Airport or the airport in Doha? A show of hands. OK. So then you have a good sense of what it's like to be in one of those airports and just see um, hundreds 
of construction workers wearing matching uniforms in line. Um, maybe you've been on a flight between um, Dhaka and uh, and a destination in the Gulf, and you might be one of the only people in the plane who, who's not a migrant worker. The scale of this issue is, is quite staggering. Um, many of you may already know that you know 95% of the workforce in the UAE and in Qatar are migrant workers. They literally sustain the economies of, of these countries. And yet, they are not afforded the most basic of protections. Um, so I wanted to just um, go through some of the, the main abuses that, that we've documented. I mean, the way that Human Rights Watch works is, um, first of all, just really investigating what the reality is on the ground. So we do on the ground investigations, interviewing workers, interviewing employers, interviewing government officials, um, looking at the laws to, to assess the situation. Um, and based on those investigations, we, we publish our reports, we follow up with uh, press releases, we have a lot of meetings, sometimes public, sometimes private. And um, among the concerns we have are abuses that happen in the recruitment system. Um, many of these workers, you know, a lot, one of the most common questions that I get from people is that, well, if the situation is so bad, then, then why do these workers keep on going? They're, they're getting a good salary. Um, th it must be a good reason for them to go. And it's very important to know that in their home countries, many workers are not getting full and complete information about their conditions abroad. Um, they may sign a contract which is very different from the contract that they get once they reach their destination country. Many of them take out huge loans which leave them indebted. Um, these can range from $700 to $1,000, $2,000, $3,000, which is a really large amount for, for these workers and puts intense financial pressure on them that they feel they cannot return home until they've paid off those fees. Um, so that's kind of the position of vulnerability that many of the migrant workers arrive in these countries with. They are indebted. They don't know what they've gotten into. Um, they may not speak the language. And um, they're, they're not aware often of their, of their rights or where to turn if they are facing abuse. Um, this is compounded by um, the, the conditions that they may face uh, when they're abroad and, and the lack of mobility that they have to leave in abusive situations. One of the things that really stands out, particularly in the Gulf, is the sponsorship or kafala system. Um, and what this means is that many of these workers, they, they come on a visa and they are tied to their employer. Um, so let's say, you know, Many immigration systems have this, where you know you come and you your visa is, is linked to an employer. What what really distinguishes the kafala system is that if you wanted to change your job, let's say you applied for another job and an employer is willing to hire you, you cannot take it unless your current employer gives you permission. Um, especially in countries, some of the uh, countries have um, additional restrictions, which means that you can't even leave the country. Um, at the end of your contract with permission from your employer. Um, and this just lays the ground for further abuse because the employers that are not paying wages, that are uh, keeping workers um, in conditions with very poor housing, making them work in the middle of the day, these are exactly the types of employers that are not going to give that worker permission to move to another employer. They're not going to give that worker permission to, to leave the country at the end of their contract. And that's one of the reasons we're seeing really high rates of uh, labor exploitation and abuse. The ILO um, just came out with a figure a few weeks ago saying 600,000 workers in the Gulf are in situations of forced labor. Um, so this is just a, a very broad, uh, characterization of, of what's going on. Um, almost every worker has their passport taken. Um, and Human Rights Watch is engaged in, in several different campaigns to try to um, improve the situation, to demand greater transparency about what the conditions are, to push for uh, reforms. Um, this 
these are reforms at different levels, whether it be changing the, the labor laws, pushing for changes in the kafala system um, by the government, but also engaging with um, businesses and companies and all the different actors who are involved because everyone really has a role to play. Um, and uh, I, I think I, I don't want to take up too much time since we have many speakers to hear from, but what I you know, think we can talk about in the, the question and answer session is that um, I th I'm, I'm quite actually optimistic that a lot can be done. I think you know the, the problems are really grave. The scale is is massive, but having worked on this ten years, I've, I've really started to see uh, a real change in the awareness of these issues and the ability of key actors to engage. These problems aren't going to change overnight, but there's incredible potential for especially incremental changes, and we're, and we're seeing that. And um, so I look forward to discussing more what some of those might be. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Walid Raad, and I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, the work that Gulf Labor is doing and just to provide a slightly broader context uh, about what's happening in um, in Abu Dhabi in particular. Um, I am a part of a group of artists and writers who um, some of the members of the working group are here in the audience as well, including Hans Hake and Gregory Shillette, as well as Beth Stryker. And uh, they can hopefully participate in the Q&A with me afterwards if they wish. But uh, we, we are a group of artists writers who are trying to um, um, push for uh, safeguarding workers' rights in, uh, particularly in Abu Dhabi on Saadiyat Island. Um, we started our work after the publication of Human Rights Watch report in 2009 detailing work uh, labor conditions on Saadiyat Island and after a visit by Andrew Ross who had participated at NYU in organizing students and the faculty in also pushing NYU to safeguard worker rights in the building of their campus in Abu Dhabi. And we spent about, uh, the effort started around 2009-2010 um, we gathered a group of around 40 artists, and for about a year, we stayed uh, behind the scenes just talking with the Guggenheim Foundation in New York about uh, what they can uh, request from their partners in Abu Dhabi by way of protections uh, uh, in the building of their campus in Abu Dhabi. Now, we concentrated on the Guggenheim in Abu Dhabi because, in a way, uh, the Guggenheim in Abu Dhabi was, uh, at the time, the only museum that was concentrating on exhibiting contemporary art. And at the time, we had also heard that uh, the Guggenheim had been given, essentially, by the government of Abu Dhabi around $600 million to buy works of art, $60 million per year for 10 years in acquisitions to not to unsettle the market. And the, 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 one of the premises was, was what, what if, in fact, the artist uh, refused to sell their work to the museum? The, the museum uh, had a building, but it did not have a collection. And it was about to go and buy works of art. And our assumption was that a third to maybe half of the works would be bought from artists from the region, a Middle Eastern artist, Arab, North African, South Asian artist. So th the idea was, let's get together, organize, and maybe use our leverage, maybe to put conditions on the sale of our work uh, to the Guggenheim in the hope of uh, moving things along. But just to give you a broader sense of um, um, what's happening in Abu Dhabi, I think most of you probably know Abu Dhabi is one of the emirates that make up the United Arab Emirates. And it's uh, not only the capital, but it's also the richest of all the emirates. Abu Dhabi uh, today contains, uh, to give you a sense of the wealth, it has between 7 to 9% of the world's oil-proved uh, reserves. Uh, most of this oil is, is they produce around 2.7 million barrels a day. Uh, about 2.1 million barrels are actually sold, and 95% of the sales go to Asia, particularly to Japan. Uh, Abu Dhabi also has between 3 to 5% of the world's natural gas resources. Uh, and they also have one of the largest, if not the largest, sovereign wealth fund. This is the savings that the state has as its disposal from the sale of the, 
uh, hydrocarbon products. It's estimated to be between six to seven hundred billion dollars. Uh, it was at some point larger than Norway's. I think today it's about the same size as Norway's. Of course, they invest the sovereign wealth fund, and it has generated them on average between seven, it's 7% 7 over the past 20 years and 8% annually over the past 30 years. It generates them a lot of cash. I mean, in other words, Abu Dhabi is not just rich, it's very, very, very rich. And they also seem to know that uh, maybe the demand for oil will shrink, and their, their economy's dependence on hydrocarbon products is, uh, they depend too much on it. So in the past few years, they've started to diversify their economy away from this dependence. They've invested in other sectors, in healthcare, in manufacturing, in education, and you may have heard that they have invested quite a bit in arts and culture. And their biggest investment is an island that they call the island of Saadiyat. It's about a 27 square kilometer island. It's a $27 billion project. And on this one island, Abu Dhabi decided to build uh, the largest Guggenheim to date by the architect Frank Gehry. It was originally planned to be around 450,000 square feet. The same island is also, uh, will have a Louvre Abu Dhabi by the architect Jean Nouvel. Uh, the same island has a performing arts center by the architect Zaha Hadid. It has a uh, Sheikh Zayed National Museum by Fosters and Partners. It has um, a maritime museum by Tadao Ando. Uh, Rafael Vignoli is designing the campus for NYU Abu Dhabi. Uh, the Sorbonne already has a campus there teaching in French. And of course, next to the museums, you will have the marinas, the golf courses. I mean, we know how these islands are built. But it's also important to say that uh, Abu Dhabi in, in this, their conception of an arts infrastructure is not just to hire these architects to build them these cultural meccas that they will then fill with high-end art from East Asia, North Africa, and the Middle East, that this alone essentially will create and bring tourists by the million and create a tourism economy. It's, it's a little more complicated because Abu Dhabi's conception of an art infrastructure is actually quite broad and quite complex. So next to the museums, of course, they have universities. Next to the universities, there's art colleges. Next to the art colleges, they're starting publications, residencies, private and public collections. They're training framers, insurers. And of course, they're also understanding that if all these students come and study at NYU and the, the Sorbonne, inevitably, Abu Dhabi will have an alternative art scene. So I think they're even, uh, th I met somebody who's, who's working on what could an interesting alternative art scene look like in Abu Dhabi in the next 20 years. And of course, this is just, I think for me as an Arab or an American or an artist, it's, it's truly fascinating. And, and just in the sense of how long have we actually been waiting for an Arab government to spend on culture, on healthcare, on education, on the arts, and it's happening today not just in Abu Dhabi, it's happening in Abu Dhabi, it's happening in Qatar, and to a lesser extent, maybe in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, and elsewhere in North Africa. But of course, every time um, you confront this and you ask the question of uh, why are the sheikhs and sheikhas in Abu Dhabi and Qatar all of a sudden so interested in the arts? Why are they all of a sudden so interested in culture? Every time you ask this question, we are confronted with uh, two caricatures of this investment, two very weighty caricatures. On the one hand, people say that all this investment in art and culture is, is a purely cynical move. It's a cynical move undertaken by these autocrats who are simply trying to diversify their economy away from hydrocarbon products onto tourism, all the while camouflaging this stay in power longer, make even more money schemes under the civilizing cloak of culture. In other words, that these Sheikhs and sheikhas don't give a damn about the arts. They just care about power and money. And if they need them a louvre in the middle of their negotiations with the French government for more mirages and military bases, so be it. We'll take a louvre. I mean, a billion dollars for the government of Abu Dhabi is nothing. And it's exactly what they're paying the French government to license the Louvre brand for 30 years. It's $1 billion. I think I calculated on average, it's what their sovereign wealth fund makes in interest every week, a $1 billion. The second caricature actually disputes this, and it says that, in fact, there's nothing cynical in this, that all this investment is the work of young, enlightened, Western-educated visionaries who are trying to do things differently than their fathers and grandfathers. 
And if these people want to uh, license Western brands, we should give them a break. Because these people are only trying to civilize first the taste of their citizens with culture before they will civilize, democratize all aspects of civil and political life. So we should give them a break if they want to license these brands because we know very well what their parents were spending all this money on. They were spending it usually buying more Ferraris and Bentleys and apartments in Tokyo, London, and Paris. And if now, for a welcome change, these young leaders want to spend it at home on healthcare and culture, we should support it. And we can say that, in other words, they're only trying to do maybe in 20 years what it took the West 100 years to put in place. The models in the West are familiar. We know very well who built the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. It was robber barons, or we can say even, let's call them American sheikhs. American sheikhs built the Metropolitan in New York and helped shift the center of modern art from Paris to New York 70 years ago. Why can't Arab sheikhs do the same thing for Arab culture? Now, we've talked in the coalition with some of the participants in this, and it's clear to us that uh, we don't know, in fact, whether these motives are, uh, their motives are sincere, cynical, or complex. We just assume, like everyone else, that these are complex individuals. And like all complex people, they make cynical, sincere, and, and um, enlightened decisions at the same time. So um, I will leave it here with this context. And if I, you have questions about our specific work with Gulf Labor, maybe we can talk about it now or afterwards. Thank you. So um, when uh, Mabel reached out to me to speak tonight, I wasn't exactly sure what it was I was supposed to talk about since um, technically I spend most of my day as a software vendor. Um, but most of my work, actually, both my academic work and the work that I do with my company, is about the relationship between technology and how architects actually do their work. And in that sense, I wanted to interrogate this question of how much of uh, construction is happening in the emerging economies uh, so heavily dependent on these kinds of labor resources that we've been talking about, and then specifically ask the question of whether there is uh, a way of interrogating that question in the context of how technology is changing the way architects do their work. I mean, it's, it's clear that the enormous amount of construction that's going on in the emerging economies right now um, has two characteristics from the perspective of the supply chain, which is really the, the way I'd like to look at the problem. Um, first, the volume of construction, and the projects that tend to pique our interest as architects are um, you know, the Abu Dhabi, the Frank Gehry Abu Dhabis, but the vast amount of construction that's going on out there in the emerging economy suffers from the exact same structural problems and is not nearly as interesting from an architectural perspective. I'm talking about the hundreds of high-rise residential towers that are in construction in, in India, the substandard schools that are being built in China. These are, these are large-scale systemic problems of the global building supply chain. Um, and in, in the United States, the labor component of construction is generally considered to be about 50% of the cost of a building. So when you do a building in the US, uh, uh, labor is about half the cost of that building. And, but delivery models, the way projects are structured to be delivered, the economics of construction are highly focused on the question of optimizing delivery for lowest first cost. How do we get this project as cheap as possible? And in the emerging economies, that sensibility, which is being uh, exported in a lot of ways because Western construction methodologies, Western design approaches, Western project management strategies, Western procurement approaches are being transferred into these other places. Uh, one of the easiest ways to solve your lowest first cost problem is to minimize the cost of labor by using the cheapest possible imported unskilled labor and simply attack the various delivery problems of construction by throwing tons and tons of labor at the problem. And it's a, it's a highly elastic strategy for making a project as inexpensive as possible. And you can see it, um, or at least I see it in my work, in the kinds of projects that we see where um, uh, an Indian developer who is also a construction company is building their projects at very high speed using large numbers of unskilled labor and porting place concrete. So these projects are, don't require a lot of sophisticated uh, construction insight. 
there's simply labor management problems, and the whole delivery problem, the lowest first cost problem, becomes one of managing the construction materials supply chain, and you can pretty much ignore most of the other part of the problem. The, the rest of the talent necessary to build a project like that is imported from the West, and the building problem itself is solved by the application of vast amounts of very inexplo uh, inexpensive exploited labor. And what we also know is that Western construction models are incredibly inefficient. I mean, this is uh, something that's pretty well understood, that the efficiency of even, uh, the, la even the models that are 50% labor are wildly inefficient, and you can solve that inefficiency problem if you're an Indian developer or a Chinese developer by simply applying a ton of labor to the design and construction problem, which is, um, which is uh, in my view, problematic on a lot of different levels, not the least of which is the delivery models, the delivery structures, the business models of construction are widely globalized now. Production methodologies are globalized. This, the material supply chain is globalized. The digital technology, the information that's used to actually construct buildings is widely globalized, which means that the methodologies that we as Western architects use to think about these problems are, are going to rapidly be transferred across the whole, um, the whole construction dilemma. And this is, a, this is an issue. This is, I think this is actually uh, one of the central questions that we should be asking ourselves is, as architects, what power or influence do we have over this particular dilemma? And this is a case where exporting Western sensibilities does not really help uh, attack the issue because uh, uh, American architects in particular are um, at best agnostic to the question of the supply chain and managing labor on a construction site, and at worst overtly hostile to the question of whether or not they have anything to do with how these problems are unfold, uh, how these problems unfold. It, this is a, a very legible development in the history of Western architecture. It's, um, it, it, its origins are from the Renaissance and the separation of design and construction that was asserted by, originally by Alberti, and which transited through the liability crisis of the 1980s to the standards of practice in this country today that are widely practiced, with some exceptions, by folks who are in this audience, where our, our American architects in particular are not interested in, and in fact are encouraged to not be involved in the question of what's called the means and methods of construction. How do, I, how do we actually get something built? What we're interested in is intent, and we delegate the problem of execution to someone else. So this is where the technology question enters in to the issue because uh, digital technologies that are starting to emerge today, things like uh, building information modeling or simulation or digital fabrication strategies, are inserting themselves into the global supply chain in the sense that they refactor the relationship between the act of design and the act of construction, the, 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 the intent of the architect and the architect's ability to manifest the physical result of that, design, uh, of that design problem. And one of the ways to look at that, at least in my view, is that these kinds of technologies, because they do bridge this gap, create a new set of obligations for architects to involve themselves in the means and methods of construction, because that barrier condition that used to exist that was at both contractual and informational, both in the terms of the way the delivery models are structured and the way information was transmitted through two-dimensional drawings is starting to disappear. And, and the opportunity there, I think, is not about uh, mechanizing construction by some kind of magical thinking and replacing the workers on the job site with their electronic doppelgangers and using digital models and, uh, to control robots, but rather to rethink the problem of what the construction supply chain actually looks like, because as we take down this barrier between intent and execution, as the kind of information that is created in the act of design becomes the basis for the act of construction, you will see the Western construction world begin to move from hand-built, stick-assembled construction strategies to manufactured, off-site, mass-customized construction set strategies, and components of buildings will be largely prefabricated and installed. As a, an opportunity to redesign the global supply chain, it seems to me that that's where architects could insert themselves because the, the, the manufacture of things that go into buildings is already a globalized business. So the question then becomes, as we begin to, as we begin to see more and more construction in these emerging economies, do you solve the lowest, do you, do you repeat the sins of the past 
to re-instantiate uh, Western delivery models, lowest first cost, non-productive models, or do you rethink the design of the supply chain in, in its entirety and begin to create sustainable, on the ground, manufacturing based, uh, con construction support systems where people can actually work and keep a job and work in a safe environment and learn something and, and learn a skill that doesn't involve simply being uh, exploited, deposited on a site to be an unskilled source of labor. And so in a way, uh, the, the problem, at least in my view, for those of us who are architects, is, is this problem that I was talking about a little bit at Columbia a couple months ago when I, when I, cro I came across some of the work that you're doing here, which is this issue of what I call meta design, which is the design of the actual design process and the extent to which the world's designers, and particularly the world's Western designers, and I don't think it's a coincidence that Waleed s spoke about leading Western architects in almost all of his examples, can begin to design a process by which the opportunity to remove this barrier condition between intent and execution, between design and construction, is actually a chance to redesign the global supply chain and thereby attack this problem of the exploitation of labor on construction sites. Okay, I'm gonna um, sort of get away from uh, speaking about labor specifically and focus a bit more on how architects and designers can work collaboratively, collaboratively with human rights organizations, um, something we've been doing in the past few years. Um, there's a lot to be said on the kind of relationship between, uh, hold on one second, sorry. Um, Uh, unpacking contracts, relationships between, uh, let's say, owners, designers, uh, construction managers, um, subs, and, uh, and workers. Um, but in, in parallel, I'd propose there's another form of kind of advocacy or engagement um, that designers can, uh, can undertake. Um, and I'm showing here a report uh, that was done completely on another topic, but I'd kind of ask you to think about it structurally with me which is to say, um, how can we rethink the human rights report to sort of leverage the tools of the designer, the ability to model, to visualize, um, and, and create a sort of more impactful uh, analysis of a human rights issue. Um, so in this case, uh, we're talking about uh, the use of uh, munitions, um, which are indiscriminate in urban environments, but it really doesn't doesn't matter for the moment. What I'm trying to show you is that there's a series of images here um, which in serial, one after the other, can be kind of um, understood better when superimposed and coupled with a digital model, something that we do every day as architects, right? So these, these kind of images which are taken on the ground uh, by citizen video and citizen photographers are really used all the time by human rights organizations. And we as architects and designers can, can help kind of complete the picture. In this case, we're trying to understand how specific types of weapons can cause damage when, when interacting with uh, different types of buildings or spaces. Um, but I would propose we could do the same thing with, um, let's say, uh, workers' um, housing conditions. Let's say there's photos on the ground that were taken of a, of a specific housing condition. What does it actually look like to fit 11 or 12 people inside a 10 by 10 room? Um, we did some work like this on, uh, on Syria uh, and different um, incarceration examples, and it's, it's a very compelling visualization and it's a very easy to understand and quickly um, communicable. So I'd propose that this is sort of within the ar arsenal of tools that designers have, perhaps not in sort of realization of buildings themselves, but um, that can be leveraged nonetheless. Um, I'll just show you one more example here. So if that's at the kind of architectural scale, this is sort of at the mapping scale. Um, to provide the sort of context. And in thinking about this, you know, this is perhaps just at the urban scale, but we could think about kind of exploding the building. What are its constituent parts? We're talking about labor. We could also be talking about uh, building components, uh, flows uh, of, of, of funding, um, and kind of mapping those uh, in a visual form. And so I just kind of propose here that um, this, this report would have happened sort of with or without us. Um, but our ability to kind of come in, without us, it probably would have been a completely textual report. It would have been maybe 20 pages of text with a few photographs. 
uh, but the, the kind of tools and the, the ability of architects and designers to kind of um, communicate sometimes what's very obvious uh, and sometimes what's already known in another sort of represent uh, powerful ideas visually um, can be hugely impactful. And I know from our experience with Human Rights Watch and other organizations, is greatly appreciated by the human rights community. Um, and so I would just propose this as a sort of alternate form of engagement. Thanks. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Edward Mayer, and I'm a senior associate at FX file. I had worked in the Mideast um, probably starting about 10 years ago as managing director for the firm, being involved with both project management in terms of delivery and working with uh, the client as well as uh, engineers and uh, contractors in the region. I started working in Dubai on several different projects. Each of these projects, uh, we worked with uh, the client very closely, who was uh, very well educated and always had a great vision of uh, very large, dynamic projects. This particular one is a bridge that we had envisioned for Dubai. Unfortunately, this was never constructed. This is another project that we envisioned with Nikhil, which we also worked very closely with the design, uh, with the owner, but this never went back into uh, construction. So. After working in Dubai for some time, we started working in Saudi Arabia and working on a, a very high profile project there, envisioning to be the financial district. This particular project uh, involved many different architects, international architects from around the world getting involved in 35 to 50 different uh, buildings, all being mixed use projects, commercial, residential, and retail focusing on the development of a large-scale uh, financial center. As you can see, these projects um, are not very uh, Arabic in style, but they're much more Western with the curtain wall systems and all these solutions. We worked with uh, local engineers in New York as well as uh, across the globe. This is a mosque that we uh, had the honor of uh, being chosen to be involved with. And uh, these projects are now under construction in Saudi Arabia. This particular project, uh, we uh, retained also foreign consultants in terms of the uh, facade fabricators, as well as the engineers that were involved on the contra contractor side also came from all around the world. It's a very large construction site. When I first started working in Saudi Arabia five years ago, the sites were not, the sites were not very clean. The sites uh, really were very disappointing to be working in and, and also being involved with. But as time went along, the contractors really started to focus on the environment with which the, the uh, workers were working in, which I was very impressed with. They started uh, providing, requiring more helmets, requiring the protection for working there, as well as in getting involved, more foreign firms, more foreign uh, consultants doing facades, providing all these large-scale services that really brought um, a greater expertise to the site, which I felt happening after the first couple years of being involved, where that more educated people were being involved in the project, more people that were actually showing a concern and a care for the development of these projects. The conversations, the communication started getting better because of this. Um, in the beginning, there was, as been, has been even discussed here about the multitudes of uh, workers working on these projects. But that started to get reduced as time went along, and now it's, there's a great um, expertise happening on the site, which uh, I'm getting more and more impressed with, and it's more of a better engagement happening there. Here you can see uh, just the type of construction happening with it's still poured concrete, but the facade systems themselves require a delicate engineering service and a delicate cons um, consultant service that is uh, being provided by some of the top uh, curtain wall consultants around the world. Here you can see, um, I'm not sure if it can show up, but just 
the sites themselves are much cleaner. The, uh, the protection that is provided, the, uh, the, in terms of all the grading, in terms of all the fencing, it's, and then just the preparation for when uh, the curtain wall itself would be brought to the site. Here is the same. And this is just to reflect just the scale of the site and just the multitude of buildings that are happening. Thank you. I'm going to kind of jump to another continent, um, Africa. We um, shop architects, firm of about 100 people. We're based in New York. We've been around about 17 years. Uh, we're still relatively young uh, in comparison to a lot of firms that are working internationally on these scale of projects. We've, uh, we've actually worked in China. We've worked in India. And actually, one of the reasons we're really not so much involved in those, 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 those two countries is really because of the type of engagement uh, we're used to. Um, I think Phil made some reference to um, the kind of the whole process of design and actually implementation. For us, it's all about making. And for us, making is not only you know, developing the design that's rationalized or founded in the process of making, but it's also about the process of communication. And what are the tools that we use to do that? And you know, I think of architects in the past, Lou Kahn is probably one of the best example, Kubu to another, where you had an architect, or architect, a Western architect, come into a country and look at its workforce look at the materials, and then allow and rationalize the architecture around that. And I think Africa probably represents the greatest opportunity in terms of rediscovering that. Um, uh, the two projects we are currently doing, both in Broken Ground, is the Botswana Innovation Hub in, in Gaborone, Botswana, and the Exhibition Pavilion in Kanza, the future Kanza technology city, just, um, just 60 kilometers uh, south in Nairobi. Um, talking about two scales, one is you know engaging the local craft in the making process and then on a larger scale the idea of knowledge transfer and what I mean by that I don't mean in terms of just technology and the A&E industry not only in the construction industry but more importantly in the academy. Actually going into the universities and sharing the technology uh, the way we process these ideas and ultimately bring them to fruition. So the two examples I want to try to try, show is kind of in terms of working with lo local cultural guilds, in the, particular in the case of the uh, Botswana Innovation Hub, this is a 350,000 square foot uh, innovation hub that the government of Botswana is building. Again, a very wealthy country relative to the rest of Africa. Uh, they they uh, produce the uh, largest quantity of clean diamonds in, in, in Africa. But the president realizes diamonds aren't going to last just like the Saudis realize petroleum won't last. And so the investment is into the future of its population in the region in terms of creating an incubator for startups. The uh, site is under construction. But uh, one of the things that uh, we found uh, as we, over our two and a half, three year period with this client, the government, was that they were interested in us engaging the local workforce, in particular the artists, and um, in particular in terms of furniture design, uh, interior design, we're working with Peter Membeo, uh, furniture designer uh, who has a factory within Gaborone where we're designing some of the light fixtures as well as some of the furniture for the innovation hub. And again, um, in broad terms, using technology in which to manage this process. The, the president was also looking in terms of, you know, trying to engage the local culture in terms of a craft that was very, very, very important to Botswana, and that's the craft of basket, basket weaving. And basically, uh, this, this, this gentleman, Oliver Groth, who manages the guild basket weavers in the country, and this is basically to promote a craft, a, a dying art, um, to bring it back to actually see this vision come alive within this piece of architecture. We met with the artists. And again, it's about, again, the artists engaging us, communicating a process in which making is, is at the heart of it, understanding the tectonic in which these baskets are made, and begin to start to think about in terms of a dialogue how we could start to rationalize it in terms of 
a piece of architecture. In this case, the cladding of a 350 seat auditorium within the Innovation Hub, the first element you would come in contact with. And again, you know, using, using uh, software in our office, uh, Rhino Grasshopper, to take basically the rules of the basket process and evolve um, a, a model in which we could begin to articulate different patterns, print the models, show it to the client, and actually fabricate components within the region. That's the key at the end of the day. This idea of mass customization is not importing the finished product, but it's actually figuring out how you can make the finished product in the region. And again, being able to have a dialogue with the artists and ultimately the fabricators, so everyone is part of the process. It's inclusive. It's vested. The challenge we, we Africa is um, somewhat is, is arrived at is is foreign investment. The Chinese are in every single country in Africa at this point, uh, basically making um, uh, deals for mineral rights, land, in in trade for construction, subsidized construction, where they import thousands thousands of Chinese labor, usually third tier construction companies, who basically come in and. Uh, I would say, to be honest, pillage the landscape. We all know the poaching problem in Kenya. Uh, it's, 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 that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's also the impact of the culture of these communities that they have the, um, the most um, um, negative impact. So in the case of our project in Kenya, our client asked, again, this is, this is the government in Kenya, asking us to try and engage in some way, first the university, and second of all, the labor force. So the idea of knowledge transfer is, 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 again, it's a process of communication. Let's just give you, give you a quick, quick background to this project. We, we're, um, we're basically on a greenfield site. It's 60 kilometers south of Nairobi. We just finished the design for a technology city that will be on the site. First phase is around 1.5 um, million uh, square meters. Um, this is the first phase. Again, there will be 10,000 units of worker housing that will be built for this first phase. Again, something we're working with a local developer in terms of modular housing, something that SHOP is very much involved here in, 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 the, in New York City with uh, our work we're doing over at Barclays. But this is the first building that's going to be built on site. They broke ground on um, this past February. It's a 30,000 square foot exhibition pavilion, basically for the project management as well as um, uh, um, developers to be, be able to work out of on the site. The site is about 5,000 acres. Uh, the pavilion is located a, near a migratory route. And the thing is that the client wanted a building that, that, that they, um, they had never seen in Kenya, but he wanted the building to be built by Kenyans, not by foreigners. And so, so the rationalization of this process was like, how are we going to communicate a concept and at the same time communicate a way in which to deliver that concept? So suddenly you're breaking the boundaries of design and you're moving into kind of the, the side of construction. Again, it's an exhibition having conference facility, project area, exhibition space on top, a green roof with, with a deck surface defined by this canopy which basically on, this, on, on the site kind of sim was somewhat symbolic of the acacia tree, which is all over, um, all over Kenya. Um, again, using the technology in terms of rationalizing the, the, the uh, surface in terms of environmental modeling, structural modeling, but being able to have a dialogue with the client and the d local designers to, in terms of rationalizing why the building was, was was evolving the way it was. And then ultimately printing models out and being able to start to, you know, translate this idea into something physical. And this is where it really gets interesting. Client loves the idea and we tell him this is going to be built by Kenyans. So how do we translate that idea of this design into a process in which uh, local students and local labor and la local manufacturer could engage. And again, it comes down to being able to, to uh, take a basic model, uh, a software that we actually train students, both countries, fourth year architecture students, how to use. Rhino, Revit, not Katia, 
but uh, basic software, even teaching them how to script it. And again, it's just, it's just a manner of going into the classroom and engaging, engaging this workforce. These interns are the ones that are going to ultimately be on the site working with us to deliver this project. And again, this is all done in-house, uh, again, working with local engineers, but ultimately, how do you take this complex geometry and simplify it? Again, it's all in the model. It's all in the building information model. In this case, translating all these aluminum fins into basic cut files, uh, rationalizing it in our, our own office in terms of a, using CATIA software, and then basically sending these cut files directly to the manufacturer in Nairobi, not China, not South Africa, not North America, Europe, but Nairobi. And ultimately looking at a way that eliminates the need of heavy equipment, that this could actually be brought together physically through riveting or, or, or screws, but ultimately it's, it's repetitious, it's monotonous, but it's something that can be done by the local labor. And again, it's all pictorial. And then coming right down to being able to manage the process from the model into the cut files to ultimately tracking it, where you can give your, your, local, your local workforce the ability to understand where things are in basically the log logistical process. And then ultimately being able to quantify things quickly. Once you empower the local labor force in, into this, this discussion, it's sky's the limits. And I, I find the, the scale, you know, we, we've all, well, I teach and a number of these individuals sitting up here also teach. And we know that through this process of using software communication, we can get our students to, you know, build anything. I mean, there's a lot of design build stu studios, even at the New School, Parsons, Yale, Harvard, Columbia. And it's not something that's non-scalable. It's completely scalable. So actually, even though this is a 30,000 square foot building, very complex geometry, the process in which we go through in our own studios in, at Columbia, Harvard, Yale, Parsons, Cornell, translates very fluidly to, to areas in the world where you know, they're, not, they're not aware of it. But ultimately, it is, it is a communication process. And for us, that's what makes it incredibly exciting. I'm going to just uh, speak briefly um, about uh, some of the trends already referred to uh, here but from the perspective of somebody who works on uh, the economic policy side and uh, from the uh, planning side. So um, if you really take the proposition that economic development is not in the usual way measured by uh, per capita income increases or GDP increases, but you really see it as a, a movement um, of a set of uh, assets really exploited by unskilled labor to something uh, much better exploited by skilled labor, which I think is, is um, quite a dominant theme when people actually look at emerging economies. You end up with a very different uh, set of suppositions about the relationship between uh, labor, technology, um, and the supply chain. And I appreciated the comments that Phil made earlier, which is I think if you want to do uh, sort of business as usual, your only uh, possibility is to really imagine the the, the supply chain differently. Um, I think the place for labor in it is very limited, and the main mechanism by which you use labor is to um, throw a lot of people at, at a problem that doesn't, would not, under different circumstances, require that many people. And these tend to be people who are relatively low-skilled and have uh, fairly few opportunities. It's also important, and I think on a panel like this where we have a lot of architects speaking, important to, to, to emphasize something that's perhaps quite obvious, which is that in a lot of these economies, construction work is really a very low entry option, uh, a low skills entry option. It's not an option. Construction labor on a lot of these projects is, um, is work you can get into quite easily uh, because the economy is not very diversified and there are not a lot of other options. Um, so it's important to keep that in perspective because anything that will, from an economic standpoint, shift the balance a little bit uh, and offer a few more 
uh, menu options will, will obviously also improve some of the conditions under which construction workers uh, work. Um, one other um, possibility which I'll mention briefly and then I'll go into a quick description of a studio project we're doing um, with Columbia students in urban planning where we're working with a client uh, in India. Um, one option is also to think about local content requirements, uh, something just mentioned, quite seriously as economic policy. It used to be between the 1950s and the 1980s around most uh, what we call developing countries, most countries that are industrializing in one way or the other, uh, those local content requirements were absolutely central um, to the way the economies changed. And most of the countries we now think of is, um, you know, the tiger economies of East Asia and all the rest built local content requirements heavily into the sectors they supported. You could do exactly the same for construction. Um, and that's something I want to put on the table and maybe we can discuss later. Um, this is a studio where we're uh, working with a local client. The client is LabourNet. LabourNet has trained uh, tens of thousands of workers, primarily in construction, but also in very unassociated other trades. But I'll focus on the construction sector. In construction, they're mainly working with informal workers. Um, and we can go into some of those definitions later. Um, but they are uh, working with people in uh, electricians, painters, uh, people working with scaffolding, uh, boring, drilling, um, uh, construction, um, crane operators, uh, and so on. And uh, they have several models, and I think it's important as we talk about possibilities to try and understand what these organizations do. Um, there really is kind of a breakdown in um, sort of labor skills uh, in many of these countries we're discussing. I'm going to be discussing India, but we've heard some of these uh, from other parts of the world. And one of the problems is that these intermediate organizations that do this kind of job matching have to do not only matching of workers to jobs, but they also have to do what uh, some uh, people we spoke to refer to as repair of an educational system that is completely broken down and is quite irrelevant to the, the labor market requirements, as well as prepare, which is kind of modular, uh, minor inducements to get workers who have a certain preparation and put them on a work site. And then there are lots of questions about how you actually get work site access to get training for these workers, because work sites themselves are very regulated. Uh, unlike, just like you have a shop floor uh, in manufacturing, nobody can walk on that shop floor and get trained. And similarly, construction work sites have to be imagined as shop floor practices where they are regulated in very strict ways. So for any worker who doesn't go through the contracting process, he absolutely, and I say he because in South Asia this is the, the um, men make up the, the majority of the force, um, don't actually get on-site training. And because they don't have on-site training, they don't get jobs. Um, our studio goals were quite modest, and I can, I can talk about them in some ways, but we were trying to imagine quite broadly Given urban informal work, how do you plan for it? How do you think about construction workers? And how might we come back to cost efficiency measures um, when we think about um, infrastructure projects in particular? So the kinds of infrastructure projects we were discussing was not, were not um, uh, some of the very nice buildings you've seen, but also quite uh, ugly things. Um, uh, things that are um, very large, take up a lot of space, things like the metro, um, bridges, highways, um, but also small water reclamation projects and so forth. Um, in India, this is a particularly difficult problem because about 93% of the workforce is what you would call informal. Um, no formal contract, irregular employment, uncertain earnings, uncertain hours, uh, and no uh, explicit legal protections. Um, this is a complex picture. I won't go into this in more detail. But the 93% is a useful number only because it shows you that the majority of the economy has to be dealt with. This is not a minority. And this, of course, the 93% is broken down in different ways. This is quite typical. This is the metro in Bangalore. Um, and these are sort of metro work sites. Uh, you can have people sitting by the side of the road, their families. You have these tin sheds uh, in terms of uh, where, they, where many of them stay. And when you actually look at the supply chain for these different projects and you ask 
uh, why are skills and productivity valuable, you really have to kind of take into consideration the different economic um, propositions um, that each of the supply chain actors is uh, debating. Uh, when they think about labor productivity, some of them are thinking in terms of uh, uh, time savings uh, and cost savings, but they rarely discuss it in terms of people savings. Why? Because, of course, labor is plentiful, it's unskilled, and it's inexpensive. So when we looked even at something like the Metro Project, you see that our client, LaborNet, uh, which sits at the LN in the center, has a relatively uh, wide engagement. And they are the type of organization in India that is growing, um, a kind of um, infrastructure um, matching agency, if you like, trying to figure out ways of engaging multiple stakeholders in the process. I think some of my colleagues here on the panel have referred to this this communication, and I would say it's not just with the client, obviously. It's with a much wider array of uh, actors. Somebody mentioned Japan. I, I have to say the Bank of Japan is directly or indirectly involved in most um, uh, infrastructure projects in India as a, a financier. Um, there have been, and I want to end, um, I sort of want to um, take you through the next few slides with kind of a, a moment of optimism. Whereas I think um, even in a country like India, which has such a staggering scale of problem, and what happens in India happens is reflected in different ways across South Asia, uh, there have been huge efforts um, to um, figure out how to deal with this. Uh, India has the largest employment guarantee system. It's a, a flawed system. There are lots of problems with it. But there have been many incremental changes, such as thinking about how to include skills uh, in an employment guarantee program, uh, which affects hundreds of millions of workers. We're not talking about millions of workers here. We're really talking about hundreds of millions. And I want to kind of emphasize the optimism I have, because there are a huge array of actors whether they are government officials who are fairly progressive, um, many of these job shops, um, architecture, design coalitions, but also a very large number of uh, economists and planners who are trying to think about how to build it into existing uh, regulation. So I don't want to paint an entirely happy picture, but I would say a lot of things have changed. And uh, in white, you see the National Skills Development Corporation here. And this is a public-private coalition that, despite its problems, I think uh, at least is putting skills somewhere in the center of the debate. Uh, the vocational ed education system is broken. And if you actually look at the uh, blue arrows, uh, you get a bit of a sense of how many people are sort of exiting the system and going into trades that are not certified uh, in many ways. And these people then don't get recognized, and it's a bit of a vicious cycle. So I'm going to um, sort of go forward uh, thinking about uh, just a few opportunities um, that do exist, even in one city. Uh, this is, um, depending on your opinion, ugly or beautiful uh, Infosys campus. Um, in Bangalore. And companies like this are building campuses across the country of 20, 30,000 uh, people. And uh, even on these, for efficiency and good economic reasons, many of them are reconsidering what exactly they need to do in terms of getting skilled workers on work sites and changing some of their building practices. I won't say it's the most optimistic story, but, but many of these um, actors are looking for new coalitions. Um, this is uh, work that one of our students has done. Um, these are other kinds of uh, building techniques that could be done at a different scale. I'm preaching to the converted here. Several of you, of course, work in these. And the students really were trying to um, think of different kinds of valuation in terms of the economics that would change the range of options available for evaluating public infrastructure, and not just thinking of public infrastructure in single ways. If you title this panel, Who Builds Your Architecture?, I would say another way to frame it is, what is public about public infrastructure? So if you can make a claim for new demand in different ways and new coalitions that pressure um, the infrastructure providers in different ways, there's actually quite uh, a bit. Um, of traction to be had. So I'm going to just uh, 
leave this uh, slide up and I can come back to it, but there's a whole series of things happening even in one city, and I just want to point out that it's by no means a model, but I think there's, uh, there are quite a few things that can be done, so both from an economics and planning perspective. Thank you. Um, it's maybe more in the spirit of getting the audience involved and questions going for me not to go up to the podium. Can everybody hear? Okay, okay. Can everybody hear? Um, there, um, I want to say thank you to everybody. Amazing presentations, really diverse set of, of issues that come up here. I, I think there are a couple of things that I want to um, focus on. Uh, one is the issue of labor, because we've seen different examples about what labor actually means. And on the one hand, we're on mass large um, projects like we're seeing from Fox and Fowls. We're talking about a laborer who is um, unskilled, um, untrained, is not part of a craft economy, is not local. Um, so, th so there's that, and they're engaged um, by contractors who are very distant from um, the architect and, and the process of design to something that is slightly more local in, in Africa where, one, where an architect could really go into um, a community and um, engage with perhaps unskilled labor, but, um, but um, think about how in the probably a new supply chain can train them um, into, a, into a process where they're um, their local knowledge can turn into a craft design based skill um, production that gets involved with with um, the kinds of thinking that the architects are bringing to the table um, and i I would say that that one of the things that I think makes it difficult for us is that when we talk about labor our our sense about what it is changes radically you know one is it's overseas and we're seeing different kinds of models overseas um, but even if we weren't going overseas I'd say that we don't even have a, a, an accurate picture of what labor is is it union is it non-union you know how are they engaged I mean I, I, I think there this is all part of the div the divide that I think Phil referred to and I think we all know about that um, keeps the designers f away from the actual builders and, and the laborers. Um, but I guess I want to uh, point out that part of that abstraction, the reason we don't have the picture, is partly one of documentation, which, which I think we've talked about. But I would also say that I don't think architects in their own practices have a sense of labor. Um, and I think we don't have a sense of labor because we don't actually think that we as, as um, partners or, or um, owners of, of our firms think properly about our own practices when we hire um, cheap labor. Um, I, th I think we don't think about fair practices within our own offices. Um, and I also think that the students and the recent graduates who are coming out, the people who we employ, don't think about themselves as laborers. And so I'm trying, I'm trying to insist that this issue of labor is an abstraction for many reasons, but it starts at home. Um, and it starts at home because we don't actually think about the, the proper practices in our own offices. Um, if we then move on to the other thing that I think is, is um, on the table here, which is the kind of, of activism that, that we might encourage architects to participate in, um, because I think part of what is being said here is if we, and I think it's a very convincing argument, that if we change the supply change and, um, and, and bring the connection between execution, between design and execution at the table through um, bringing it to the manufacturing floor and the training that goes with that, um, that we still in some way have to get a um, discipline, get architecture as practitioners to want to make that happen. We have to be activists. We have to have that desire. Um, and it's not, it's not going to happen just by the force of, of um, economics. We get things cheaper that way. It's going to have to actually um, be motivated by um, social interest. Um, and I would suggest that we, as architects, um, don't have that social interest. 
um, as long as we don't see ourselves as workers or see ourselves as employing workers. And so I'm trying to connect the idea of this abstraction okay. of labor, because okay. we don't actually do it at home, that as long as, as labor yes. and work is abstracted, we don't have a social consciousness. Okay. As we don't identify as workers, we're not going to have a social consciousness. So both of those things, I think, get connected to, um, to an I attitude that we um, need to cultivate within our own discipline um, that really recognizes that we are workers, we hire workers, and hence, if we want to identify with the workers either here that are construction workers or overseas, whether they're skilled or unskilled, we have to start by identifying ourselves as workers, which is not happening now. Um, I, I do think that the issue of documentation, which, which um, came up, I think, both with Nisha and, and with Brad, is hugely important here. I, I think we don't have um, any real pictures. We're, be we're beginning to get them here, I think, with, with your different presenters, of what it actually means to envision the kind of work that laborers at all different levels are doing. We just don't picture it. We don't know it. We're a visual discipline. As long as these are numbers, as long as these are percentages, as long as these are diagrams, we're not going to have it in our heart and soul to in any way identify it because we can't picture it. And so I think that is one of the significant um, things that, that we need to work on. And, and Brad, I think, I think it's, it's important that you actually are doing that, that work here. Um, I guess that's what I wanted to talk about. Think about labor at home, then we can start thinking about it. <laughs> in the construction site, and then we can start thinking about it overseas. Um, and again, connecting that to a certain activism, which we need to get into our DNA, which, um, which is not, not um, the case yet. So. OK. Thanks, Peggy. So uh, beyond all of these wonderful kind of presentations, there really isn't a, a script from here. Uh, basically, the idea is to, um, to put two and two together in some degree, at least, uh, to to you know make a little bit of progress, uh, and and as was said in the very beginning, th this this is like an ongoing project uh, initiated by the organizers. Uh, there have been a variety of other such things, and and certainly there will be others. So so sort of you know what what one could do with this type of knowledge that's been presented, for example, would be something to think about. I would just add one more question. Maybe it's a, I don't know if one. It's sort of in the spirit of the specificity of this particular panel, um, in which the figure of sustainability was uh, sort of invoked, but in a way that's not familiar to, and particularly, you know, this is uh, related to Peggy's point, uh, not familiar uh, in everyday um, either civic discourse or professional discourse. Uh, you know, green roofs and so on. Uh, in other words, sustainability of uh, life itself human life, human uh, well-being uh, is, uh, is sort of front and center in this particular framing. Um, so the strategic question that I want to pose to our assembled uh, colleagues is, is how then to connect any of the dots that you've sort of laid out for us to a strategi the strategic use of the category of sustainability, um, either practically or sort of more in principle. <laughs> yeah, I, I think on the, um, speaking from the planning side where I see actually a tremendous opportunity, um, I think there are, the studio went some distance towards this, but we have a continuing engagement with the lab and um, groups in India where we're trying to understand uh, different ways of promoting and privileging some forms of sustainability over others. By that I mean the following, which is, if we imagine that workers are involved not just in the creation of these projects, but of course they're involved in the fruits of these projects in some cases, they could be better involved in the fruits of some of this building. That would be uh, making it more likely that their housing, their water supply, their sanitation would be projects that could be brought into the debate. Now, it isn't just social conscience that would get this to happen. There's tremendous pressure um, on the government in that case to actually see some of this through. So there is a political mission, and I think there is a, a need for advocacy uh, and, and a lot of campaigning to get some of that uh, seen through. I think there have been moves to, for instance, um, maybe to take a leaf out of the 
uh, other sectors, uh, instead of just looking at the construction industry alone, uh, there are some interesting lessons to be learned from how gains have been made in the health industry, uh, gains have been made in water, uh, waste, and solid management, in the way in which workers have been brought in. So these are some of the other examples where things are a little bit more directly connected to sustainability, and I see some gains having been made. There are a series of planning techniques and um, valuation procedures that I think can effectively be used, and I think groups are effectively using them. Sorry, but just to add, add to this, the in a, in a way, I take the framing to be something like the category of sustainability has a kind of purchase, uh, culturally, politically, yes, but uh, but uh, you know, in the imagination, and and is being leveraged here in in a certain way, and that that's I guess what a, you know, particularly like to, okay, on the one hand, there's policy, but then then there's the arts, and then. Uh, which too speak that language, and of course, architecture speaks that language, and it, I take it that the the, the the you know little the sort of tactical move here, uh, which could become more broadly strategic, is is to insert into that language, um, or modify that language a little bit, uh, to incorporate the well-being of humans, um, uh, who make this the green design and so on and so forth. So, uh, does that make sense? Do anybody have any recommendations? This is an action-based uh, group. The plan is to have a plan. <laughs> How many architects do we need to make a plan? I mean, I think yeah. yeah. If I could just respond. I mean, I think tactically, I think, I think there is, I think there is some purchase to it. Um, I don't think it should be overextended. I think people tire from the phrase sustainability as well. So I think if one is going to be strategic on a, on a labor issue, I think there are only some ways in which it can be leveraged, and those ways are probably the ones where they overlap the most. I'm just hazarding um, based on some of the issues we debated in the studio particularly. Um, some of the ways in which it becomes easiest for groups to tie into the normal definition of sustainability and then bring them in. Um, and in some cases, they happen to have easy overlap with the labor issue. I think Bill. Yeah, I, I kind of want to touch on sustainability as it relates to the office, office culture. And I think Peggy kind of alluded to because at the end of the day, it starts at home first. And, um, you know, your approach to um, some of the architecture uh, that was, architects that were mentioned in in relation to the Guggenheim, NYU, um, the museums. I mean, ultimately, I went to school and one of my goals was to do a museum. I haven't, we haven't done a museum yet. <laughs> but, but it's that expectation of, you know, there's firms out there that do hundreds of competitions uh, yearly and, and they pump out the work, they pump out the ideas, but it's as a sustainable culture. For us, um, you know, the seven partners that make up shop have very diverse backgrounds. We actually came to architecture kind of in our midlife. And uh, whether it's finance, you know, uh, political science, engineering, that really had a huge impact in terms of thought process, ideas in the office. Because when you rely on one idea and one person, it does become fixed. It becomes very uh, static. And so, when we make reference to you know this process of communication and investment and, and you know when people become part of the idea part of the solution Lou Kahn was very good at this he would he would it wasn't just about him coming in and projecting an idea it's getting everyone to kind of buy into the process of this idea and then you know bring something to the table and ultimately for us it's no different than when we're working with our own staff and allowing them to engage the process of the design, but it's the same thing for us when we get into the field and you're engaging someone on the side. I have no problem, none of us have any problem walking up to a laborer and you know, start engaging them on an issue, whether we understand what's going on or not, uh, you know, starting a dialogue and it's kind of, Scaling that relationship, and again, it's the kind of culture of design and making that 
at the end of the day, it's the most sustainable way in which to work. It's not fixed, it's always changing, it's always evolving, it's always adapting. And at the end of the day, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the, um, the hope for the office, that you know, even without the founding members of SHOP, the office will keep going. And in a sense, that's, that's kind of the way we look in terms of our construction process, our making, and this is something you translate not by a singular approach or single idea, but many approaches in which then you use technology in which to, to you know, enhance that. So I think from the standpoint of sustainability from office culture, it's a culture that's not fixed, but it's always open. And it's always translation. It's reversioning itself. And I think that's something that's incredibly, uh, uh, that's a translation you can make into any scale, in particular in terms of the building process. I mean, maybe I'll, um, we, we took an interesting trip at some point in uh, Abu Dhabi, a few of us who were here to uh, the workers' construction village, which was presented as the ideal kind of a model. So it's, it housed currently about 10,000 workers, and it's built to house about, uh, it's expected that it will have about 40,000 workers. And it, what was interesting is when we went in there is uh, during the tour, is the workers, of course, uh, go through what, what, what they refer to as this induction process where they're read the contracts in, in various languages. And you go in and um, you're shown the various cricket fields, you're shown uh, the various uh, prayer centers, uh, the housing that can house two, four, six, or eight workers. You're shown the showers, the towels that are given, the various foods. It's Bengali, it's Pakistani, it's Indian, it's Middle Eastern. And, and in a way, what's strange about this space is how much it looked like a university or an airport or a mall. I mean, in a way, there was a continuum between this kind of space and other spaces. So the question when you were in there was not, uh, well, maybe the f cricket fields should be a little bigger or the food should be a little more varied. So it's something strange about being in this space. And this was, of course, the exception because that's not where all the workers, at least in Abu Dhabi, are housed. This is what's supposed to be the model space. So seeing the space and seeing it um, on this continuum with other kinds of spaces, uh, with, again, the university, the hospital, the, the mall, uh, the airport, I was trying to think of what it, what it was that needed to be visualized in this case, let's say, uh, because I found, I think, the rethinking of the supply chain and this idea of visualizing really pertinent uh, in this instance. And I was trying to think, how, how, what is it that needs to be imaged here? What is it that needs to be visualized? Is it, is it the transfer of the workers from um, uh, Kerala, the, 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 the exact transfer, the induction process, the movement? But there were also a very non-visual kind of, there were immaterial kind of elements uh, th that needed to be somehow visualized that I think you're working on. And maybe I would love to hear more about the rethinking of the supply chain. I mean, uh, the more ideas you can tell us, at least I'm sure it'll be uh, helpful for us in our work. Well, I mean, it could, I think it could be really interesting if um, if one of the extensions of the shift in the means of representation from these kind of abstract diagrams called plans and sections to models could be extended to this idea of understanding the implications of certain kinds of construction decisions. So when I decide to use a cast-in-place concrete building in the outskirts of Mumbai, based on some kind of data extraction, I'm told, well, let's see, that's 565 guys for three weeks, and based on the last 10 projects that were built, eight of them are gonna get killed, because that's, what, that's, that's the safety record of these projects, and we can only house 400 of them on the site, so another 200, 200 are gonna be living in tents. I mean, it's this kind of combination of big data, geospatial information, and construction strategy. And, and this idea that you could actually understand the implications of these decisions a priori, which is from a technological point of view. I mean, hell, your kids are doing it with their shoot 'em up games on their iPads right now. It's not a technological problem to do this. But the question is, are we interested in that kind of information? I was just curious, you also wanted to ask, I wanted to ask Walid if they showed you, I don't know about this particular one, but if they showed you where they kept the passports and all of that stuff, like the sort of back of the house which is the structural condition by which that was described, described initially. But um, the, uh, what if the client says, 
okay. You know, you demonstrate That's the whole right. thing. 14 deaths are okay on this. Yeah, risk That's management right. says it's okay. So how does one, in, in some level, because, you know, the, the, this, we talked about this actually in the, in the, the Architectural League meeting. There, there may be an aspect of this that is transparent, that, you know, in the sense there are things that do need to be disclosed, represented, and I think, you know, the, the situ work is a wonderful um, sort of demonstration. Uh, so, but, but one can also imagine, and maybe you've encountered these kind of situations, in which they say, okay, I accept this. Uh, as, as a, in a sense, as is. Uh, how does one speak in those terms? Likewise with architects attempting, again, this was discussed, to, to negotiate or renegotiate contracts, insert clauses that want to, you know, sort of minimize the exploitation at least, these kind of things. You know, what, how does one, what do, you, what do you imagine would be, would constitute leverage at that, the moment of truth? I'd suggest that there's perhaps the kind of instrumental approach where you run through scenarios and you understand the implications in real time as a designer, but there's also the kind of human rights model, which is the kind of naming and shaming or naming and praising approach, right? Which really <laughs> begins to like structure. No, I'm serious about yeah. the naming and praising because sure. I think there's examples here that deserve to be seen. I don't know what other contexts they're going to be shown in, but something as unique as this, but they should be seen by more people. But the point is that it, it begins to um, form behavior. Mm. And, and, f and, and, and we anticipate these problems, um, and so there's more eyes on decisions that are made. So I, I would say it's, it's both the kind of in real time instrumental approach as well as the kind of uh, activism, uh, advocacy approach in parallel. Yeah, that's a good point. I just want to, to add, add a piece to that, which is I think if shaming, advocacy, all of these are parts of it, I think as much as we discuss the construction supply chain, one of the things that has evolved in parallel to it as public administrators who are speak more who are public administrators who are um, I think struggling to come to terms with a reimagination of what the construction sector would look like. So while we visualize and so on, and one of the difficulties is um, showing the kinds of risks that financiers, uh, developers and public officials would perhaps also uh, be looking towards, not just, and, and I think there's a lot of power to that. And I think coming back to the sustainability debate, one of the pieces to be, to take tactical advantage of is the whole idea of risk. Um, <laughs> around the, the documentation issue, in some ways it's related to the sustainability issue. Um, it does seem to me that part of what we're talking about are people's, people's lives, that these aren't just laborers who exist um, either in either in the housing or um, on the job site or at the moment that they're putting their documentation into a safe or whatever, um, their larger lives and they've come from some place and that, that place that they've come from, um, they're now cut off from, they can't go back freely. And so it's, I, I would I would want to suggest that it's, it's, um, it's the social life of the labor that, that would be fully documented too because I think that's what, what's at risk there. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, just just then to connect that to the sustainability issue, I, I think it, one of the things that that would show is the very, very specific ways that different laborers are, are I don't even want to say exploited, the, the, the way that their social life is changed by the particular contracts that they have or the particular work that they, that they do. Um, but that same particularity is the reason that I think I resist the sustainability model too much because I think um, for better or worse, we have such a singular notion of about what what that means, and this particular condition, well, probably all sustainability issues, but the particular labor one is so specific. For me, that's the thing that I really learned in all of you showing. Well, I guess I shouldn't say all of you, but the images that we have of workers in India, in Africa, in um, in um, Abu Dhabi, all these different places, is that it's just different, and that difference is part of the humanness of, of the problem, which which needs to be conveyed and can't just be um, sound bited away or, or whatever. So that's. Yeah, I guess I'll just say that um, I don't interact with architects a lot. And what's really struck me about this decision, I mean, at this discussion, is this very strong sense of a divide between design and execution, which I think is, is quite a false divide, and that there's quite a lot of privilege that's you know, been taken advantage of in 
uh, kind of separating design from execution. Um, I, I think there have been some really great examples of, of thinking of how to use technology, how to interact with local labor to, to make those more interactive and to start to dissolve that. And so I think a question is, what are some ways to challenge that, that sense of um, separation between those two, whether it be in the classroom, whether it be in some requirements that you don't just have diagrams of, you know, the actual physical structures, but you do start to visualize, um, you know, the, the people who are involved in, in, in making these, uh, these structures come to life. Um, you know, I think that challenge, though, is not everything can be visualized. Uh, that some of the conditions that we're concerned about, well, yes, it's quite easy to, to think about housing, um, but, you know, if you take the, the model housing in, in Sadiat Island, um, one of the, the, the biggest uh, weakness that we saw in that is when we interviewed the workers, or when actually there was the independent um, audit of that, 75% of the workers were still paying recruitment fees. Um, and so I guess it's a question of, you know, how do you align the, the integrity of a design that somebody takes, you know, pride in? I, I was a part of this project and I am, you know, giving my talents and skills to, to engage in, in this work and make that, you know, deeply intertwined and inseparable from an integrity in terms of ethics and in terms of how it's executed. I mean, just to, um, and this was, of course, contrary to what everyone had been saying there, that in fact, at least in this case with the Workers' Construction Village in Abu Dhabi, uh, Abu Dhabi had done its internal monitoring, the TDIC, the Tourism Development Corporation, and at one point issued a report saying that they found a small percentage of the workers had paid recruitment fees and only at the insistence of various groups. And I mean, one of the important things that Gulf Labor has pushed for is the hiring of an international monitor to monitor existing labor policies. And we recommend it. I mean, what's remarkable about our relationship with the Guggenheim is we sit down and they ask us for recommendations on uh, monitors. I mean, what do we know about monitors? I don't know anything about monitors. And I have to spend, or we have to spend six months doing research on monitors or asking Human Rights Watch for recommendations on monitors when the Guggenheim or, I don't know, Gary's office or Nouvelle's office should have had very good ideas on labor monitors the, the, who are able to do this kind of work and are able to monitor their own site. So we end up recommending six labor monitors and they go out and hire Price Water Coopers, one of the outfits we actually said might not be the ideal uh, uh, outfit, at which point we even say that's fine could they hire any of the six recommended monitors to consult with them? And that, that even led nowhere. I mean, one of the important things maybe in terms of visualizing was sweat. Like, for example, the idea that you don't sweat in Abu Dhabi. I mean, you, don't, you can't pee in Abu Dhabi because you're sweating so much. So how do you do that? How do, how do you image that? The idea that you're not, you can't pee. Because the water is just being drained out of your body and that you're supposed to stop working at 50 degrees Celsius, well, lo and behold, the temperature's 49.5 degrees, 300 days of the year. <laughs> or at, at in, in a number that is unbelievable. Yeah, um, hang on. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, if you kind of extrapolate, let's say, and, and it's kind of what I'm getting at a little bit by asking, okay, what happens when the client says no, or something like that, that there, one has to assume, I, I think, kind of structurally, that there are what used to be called contradictions built into this whole, um, you know, fiasco, um, that have to be, uh, you know, they can be named differently, they can be framed differently, but at some level they ought to be probably articulated. Um, and, uh, and I'm, you know, personally at least interested in, uh, Seek, looking, looking to tease these things out just a little bit uh, for practical reasons, you know, not, not for, as it were, intellectual reasons as much as for uh, leverage. Uh, so one of them would be, what does power want here? The question, that, you know, because that's what you're basically describing. You're describing the way we know that power works. Power works by saying yes, you know, not by necessarily saying no. And, and so what does one say when 
you could flip it around. What does one say when the client says yes when you know that what they're actually saying is no? Or the government or whomever. I mean, just, you know, to, just to sharpen the contradiction. I mean, I can only speak for what was happening on our site relative to at least during the construction stages where I saw things that I felt that the client should know. And so I would speak to the client openly about concerns that I would have, but not documenting, but I would try and at least enlighten the client to somehow either make himself aware of it or to uh, go out himself or some other form. And so what he started doing was more just hiring additional firms to oversee the construction process. Now, I'm not sure of what was happening in terms of the labor camps. I can only speak for what I saw happening in the construction process on site, where more and more groups of different um, companies were following and tracking what was happening on site. And that's what at least started the change that I saw in terms of the environment that they were working under. That the first days I'd go there, I wouldn't want to go to the site because it it just it was ungodly to be there. It was it was it was just very dirty. It was very messy. It was it was it almost felt unsanitary. But as time moved along and more and more people started getting involved in oversight, the site became more clean, it became safer to be. And then there were more um, OSHA requirements. There were requirements for wearing all of the protective equipment, which wasn't there before. So I mean, this is at least what I saw under the actual construction site itself. And then having um, Western international firms involved started educating at least some of the labor force. There was now an educated labor force on the site that was being involved. But I want, I can certainly imagine, um, you know, incrementally aspects of what used to be called also, I'm using all this old-fashioned language, but development or modernization, uh, enlightenment even, um, you know, as, uh, as progress, as sort of as you're describing, movement from one condition to another. Uh, but what I am, I'm sorry for persisting with this, but I'm trying to get at, it's related to the sustainability question, uh, because, you know, we're familiar with things like greenwashing and so on, that, uh, that structurally, in order for us to be able to appreciate something like progress or, you know, the kind of movement from one to the other, basically somebody has to die. And, but what's, what's happening is that somebody's, that, 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 that the, the thing has been displaced. Uh, that death is not necessarily occurring before your eyes anymore. And, and uh, you know, it's a kind of moving target. You, one is, sort of in a sense, always chasing um, the, the sort of crime scene. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I know that that makes the situation seem even more dire because, it's, you know, it's as if when, uh, you know, maybe the passports are no longer confiscated here or maybe there are cricket fields over here but not over here. You know, a little bit of progress has been made. Um, but uh, but I, it's just that cultural workers, I mean, I'm speaking mostly, you know, and we're in a university and cultural workers are assembled here, are so good at making universal claims about what they think ought to be, like, and sustainability stands for one of those kinds of claims, and we, we speak like that so frequently. So anyway, I'm going to ask actual question at this point. <laughs> <laughs> the question is how to speak in a sense, how to name the precariousness, you know, while at the same time looking for the, fi the fixes, the, the local solutions, the little improvements here and there. How to recognize that, um, that the clean construction site is of course desirable, but at some level it's like the cricket fields. You know, it, it, it's, it could be a distraction or it could be, you know, genuine improvement. Well, you could, if you wanted to really um, extrapolate this idea in the extreme. I keep going back to this. You, you kept saying, what happens when the client say it's, yeah. says yes? One of the things that I have a hard time explaining to my students um, in my practice course at Yale is this idea that there are certain professional responsibilities that extend beyond whatever the client says. Because as a licensed architect, your fundamental obligation is to protect the public's health and safety. And the client, in certain circumstances, simply can't say yes. The client can't say, well, I'm not going to spend enough money on that sprinkler system. 
or I'm going to put a flammable carpet in that lobby, you have to say no or you lose your license. So if we really, I'm, I'm less concerned about the location of the cricket field. You could take the idea of professional licensure and extrapolate it to the definition of the public's health and safety to include the health and safety of the people working on the job site. But you would have to simultaneously empower architects to have control over those kinds of things. And I don't know how many architects that are in the audience here, but there's a whole generation of us, myself included, who've been trained to do exactly the opposite. I think if, uh, if we saw Raphael's video, I have a feeling that, because he's been working with the AIA and other groups to, to you know, in a sense, build that in. Uh, are we going to see it? I guess we're not going to see it. But, <laughs> but I think he would probably affirm at least some aspect of what. Yeah, I mean, if we said to uh, you know, Frank Gehry, if five guys are killed on that job site next week, you are personally responsible. That would certainly change the equation. <laughs> would it? But okay, we want no? to have. Yeah, anyway, I don't know. We, we're going on. Peter. Oh, yes, they need our microphones. Um, I'm not, <clears throat> maybe there's a maverick <clears throat> function here. This might be useful. Uh, I, I did some work in the Middle East, and um, I had, um, I was an artist. And I had very good relations with the workers, these Pakistanis or people in labor camps and had their passports taken and so on. And in every case, well, in some cases it was quite successful. They actually did things with me that they volunteered to do and they liked doing it, but it was in their off time and, and actually near the labor camp. And we talked and all that. But in other cases, it was uh, where we would try to do something at the job site or the show site, and then it was prohibited by the client. And so I, I, I feel that after all the things you've been talking about, and I think there's an exception with uh, what's happening in Africa there, the client is the problem. The client, whether it's some rather Tokyo Metropolitan Government or some other entity like, say, um, Sarja, the Sarja Biennial, they are uh, very rigid in their idea that uh, the artist is here, the worker is there, uh, the architect is there, and they all have their particular look. They cannot talk to each other. And um, it would be, I think, very important to almost make a demand up front to the client, like what you were saying there before. Um, actually, the client is responsible for the deaths on the job site. And the, the client is now going to have to really, and the client is also resp responsible, for, responsible for some kind of way of having the workers be human, uh, whether it means having an artist around just to do some tingling, and then the workers like it, and they talk about it, whatever. But I, I had a number of rather quite almost miraculous experiences with workers where they really came to life and really liked the model, really wanted to do something, and actually volunteered to do things way beyond the normal idea that uh, you're the Westerner, they're the client, they're the worker. And so I guess the question really is, how can, else in terms of human rights, one come to a client and say, first of all, we gotta have an understanding that workers are human beings. Maybe a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not. That mic, you have to yeah, grab sorry. Grab it's not an entirely rhetorical in the sense that um, with human rights work, it, it's extremely important and also simultaneously extremely dangerous to provide identities of people who are at risk for various reasons. You know, it, you, we're working on a case with drone strikes, civilian casualties and drone strikes, and it's this paradox of the only way that that um, analysis is going to actually register with people is to, is to show that real real people suffered real in injuries, right? At the same time, all their faces are redacted. So uh, I imagine that there's uh, uh, people, laborers are at risk. Their identity, you know, their their ability to kind of speak up is uh, compromised in these situations as well. Sorry. Right, but he's saying that that, that in more broadly, they're risking something potentially, even if they don't acknowledge it. No. Anyway, yeah. Maybe there should be programs with the client on site for two weeks so they can have the same conditions as the workers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, um, our, the, the group we were working with had some success in um, behavior based um, safety training. Um, as a way in which to get to some of the concerns of worker safety, health, and all the rest. And it became a mechanism whereby compliance for other parties 
ended up becoming the mechanism by which organizations for workers can take one little box on the compliance checklist and use it as a means for getting a lot of other things under. So in terms of strategizing, it actually allowed a lot of things that would not have been called behavior-based safety training to get on the list. But taking a, a leaf out of the, the stories of other sectors can be very useful. I mean, I know construction is quite unique, and architects, of course, have very particular kinds of problems to face. But in the apparel industry, in uh, shoe manufacture, all the rest, there have been third-party auditing and, and trademarking safety checkboxes that have gone through, and they have actually built out into very wide-based coalitions, and uh, even when the client said no, or client said yes, depending on the definition. Just because I have it while we're passing this, but I d it, it does seem to me that one could think about if one's lo lo using the sustainability model, the grading of of a of a of a client of of an owner that, that they really are uh, ways of indicating who who builds well and that's part of their reputation and that's NRA part of approach. exactly <laughs> right in in the opposite direction. Um, but um, but that then goes to um, who's going to finance it, what what kind of corporations support it, where you, where they are going to put your stocks and bonds. I mean that 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 grading can actually be influential um, financially. Have implications. Um, yes, uh, thank you so much for your uh, panel today. Uh, today we've heard so many different you know uh, opinions. So the the fault is with the client. The fault is with architects who don't think about the whole process. The fault is somewhere there. You know, <clears throat> some people just blame workers. So, but uh, actually working as part of the TC Lab studio, we've talked to many different professionals from, from actually different points in supply chain. And most of the people do have um, sympathy and desire to help the workers to, to help this, to create this ecosystem for everybody. But it seems that the incentives are not aligned everywhere, this, all these points. And I would like to know your opinion. First of all, like as architects there and other professions, how do you think, how do you put those incentives together? And where should it come from? Can't just architects as Grusrat uh, uh, advocacy, uh, just as a, can they advocate for something to change? Do they have to wait for the government to come in and create a policy for them to, to abide for? Should it be in a tender, some kind of system? Where do you think would it come from to actually change this and not point fingers and say the blame is there somewhere? Thank well, you. I'll tell you, the, the building industry is famously terrible at self-regulating. There, there are very few mechanisms for the industry outside of governmental mechanisms to create those kinds of structural incentives because the delivery mechanisms and the, and the business models are so disaggregated that there are very, very few aligning forces. So we all may have desires to do the sorts of things that you're talking about, but there are very few large-scale ideas out there besides government regulation, like we're going to shut your job down after the second guy gets killed, um, that, uh, that create those aligning forces. They just don't exist. Uh, the only the other way I see it is just maybe the getting the workers to empower themselves by getting a trade, which I think is something that you're developing very well in Nairobi and in Africa in terms of actually giving them the ability to build. And in some ways, that's also what happens if you can have a uh, a a, uh, a fabricator can locate within this region and start to engage and also educate and provide skills to these unskilled laborers. That gives them a power then, because they really need to be empowered. And right now, they're not empowered, and so they get used. How about unions? How uh, unions, um, there has been moments of revolt you know, in labor forces in the Mideast. Um, they don't go very far, but they do occur. So that would, I don't know how you create labor unions that is not part of that culture at this moment. I mean, you know, we actually brought this up in our February discussion, um, the press. 
you know, in the, you know, we look at what what happened to Apple about a year ago and the impact. You know, one of the strongest companies in the world uh, was called out. There are a lot of architects that need to be called out, and you know, if it, there's no excuse for us not to be looking beyond our our computers in terms of how things are being implemented, and um, you know, that's. I would just say that's a very New York way too, um, um, and until shame and shame, yeah, and I, you know, all you have to do is go to some of the lectures, and you see what what's discussed, it's ideas, concepts, theory, but does that ever translate to you know the theory of you know the the labor force in terms of how you move that forward? I mean, we're in the 21st century. Yeah, we have put someone on the moon, but that that's even dated now. But you know. How come we have not been able to move that forward? We're still building the way we were building, you know, po post World War II. So, you know, again, when you start seeing the academy respond to it, and in some degree, a lot of the universities that are in this room are responding to it in terms of the way to teach, teach students technology, uh, the kind of seminars. But at the end of the day, until that translates into the architecture profession, where we're forced to take responsibility, and I say the press is a big influence here. Um, we're going to constantly hide behind, you know, liability and contracts. So, and I would speak also for the institutions themselves, whether it's NYU or the Guggenheim or Museum of Modern Art, you know, there's a responsibility they have to take as well, and again, the press has a huge influence there. So is social media. So, again, you know, grassroots, but you know, when questions start being asked, things start, you know, being uh, challenged on the public forum. Uh, there is a reaction. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Eventually, Diana will get. Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. No, no. Oh, um, so I have a question um, uh, related back to uh, the relationship between human rights and sustainability, or labor conditions and sustainability. And one of the things that. Uh, um, really made me think about this is when you, uh, sorry, the you were talking about the redaction of the faces um, for the drone strikes, and um, one of the things that I uh, I was really thinking about was that in uh, is that we have this sort of unique opportunity at this point. Like at you know uh, most of us in the United States, again, there, there's purchase with the green uh, uh, with in uh, sort of sustainability. Um, we're uh, the real opportunity is uh, here um, that labor conditions and saving the earth are, are not at odds. Like these are not um, imperatives that are at odds. So the responsibility to sort of represent human beings is no longer, um, is no longer the only represent representational opportunity. Like we, we feel it, we experience it in sort of the, in climate change. And I, and I wonder, then um, I don't know. I guess the I don't know if this is a question, but like the trauma of of, of losing our very environment, um, sort of, uh, I mean, forges a new relationship to sort of human rights uh, in 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 a way. I mean, I don't know if this is making complete sense, but is it something like? Because I, I don't know if this is the obverse of what you're saying, or but. Climate change has been actually very difficult to discuss because you can't quite see it in the classic sense, and it is like I mean, really, it is the model for the you know so-called risk society, and so on. That that it that it's exactly the abstraction. It, it this is actually basically what happened in in critical discourse. That that the the old language about abstraction that used to apply to labor has been moved on to the climate. Um, uh, you can't see it, it's abstract, and therefore even the new, you know, whatever, a few uh, weather pattern kind of models and so on isn't going to convince anybody. So, and certainly, I mean, Peggy mentioned this at the very beginning, but it, it does seem to me to correlate. As I said, I don't know if this is exactly what you're saying, but yeah. that what we're actually talking about, the, the precariousness that we're actually talking about is structurally invisible. In some sense, but it is the same yeah. precariousness. That yeah, yeah, exactly, right, right. Exactly. It, they're related. I mean, it, I mean just to add one more historical note, I mean, one of the things that I was thinking about when Philip was uh, talking was actually Ruskin, just because for him it was so easy to represent the labor 
of man, right? It was in the Gothic stone, the, the independent, you know, it was in the independent carving of each man, and, yeah. and its personality was expressed through that. Um, and, and now we can't, it's, it's almost impossible, I don't, it's almost impossible to do, to represent that at this point. Yeah, but we in, wouldn't want to mystify it. I mean, okay. I'm and so, anyway, we're dealing with abstraction on either end. But anyway, sorry. I just want to say one tiny thing, and in some way it um, complicates what you're saying, but one of the things that um, came up when we had the discussion in February at the Architecture League was, was the fact that um, for um, uh, the environment, one could actually see the polar bear on that little yes, body of, of ice yes. disappearing. And so that, yeah. that is something that we always like, yes. boom, that's we representable. That, yeah. And what is the corresponding thing <laughs> around um, indentured labor that would be the same thing. It would be really, really helpful if we could figure out what, <laughs> what that was. Sure. And, uh, so, anyway. But, Phil, yeah, anyway, I think you. A, yeah. um, uh, quick question. Um, just um, love your thoughts and feedback on this. Um, in um, doing some work in the Middle East, one of the things that we heard often from several of the rulers there was that all the, all the quote unquote indentured labor that comes into the Middle East wasn't forced to come there. They came there of their own free will and they can leave if they don't like it. Uh, that actually was in the press, uh, not just in one country but in a few countries. So how do you actually respond to that when it comes from, uh, you know, all the way from the top? Well, I mean, I'd say that the top is probably the least likely to know the reality on the ground. And, uh, you know, having independent verification, talking to workers themselves, um, w there is widespread documentation, not just from Human Rights Watch, but from many groups, um, including groups um, in the home countries of these workers, um, that it's, it's just extremely well established that many of these workers um, aren't given accurate uh, information about their jobs. Uh, that they are not free to leave. And so it's maybe confronting, uh, you know, when, when people make these claims, it, it's confronting them with, with the information and the documentation that, that disputes that. Just one, one more thing in terms of... Well, there's the issue of also the recruitment fees that was just so crucial, in, at least in our uh, conversation. That's right. You're taking uh, uh, two to three thousand dollars that most of the time is being borrowed or is being uh, taken as a loan. That essentially is what you'll make, or if you're able to save that in a year or two, you're a lucky person. So essentially, you have this debt sitting on your head as you're trying to work off uh, getting paid a fraction of what you thought you were going to get paid. And so the idea of just leaving. work there a minimum of three years because you first you have to pay off first you have to pay off you know the money that you gave to your recruiting agent and then you want to save a little for the family that's waiting for you otherwise you spend three years of your life or two years of your life and you come back with nothing but my, I mean these are all well-known facts I mean you just have to google it and it all shows up if you travel there you know it my question is not that that I think some of this conversation is I mean really great points but when it comes all the way from the top and the economics of that region are such that it ain't going to change anytime soon. You see, they're coming there because they need the work. So I understand what you're saying, that you can tabulate it, you can go into social media. Khalid's time is not going to carry the story. It ain't. It ain't. You know, when there was the big labor uh, strike they ran across Sheikh Zayed Road, nobody carried it. But you so know, the top is also doing multiple things at the same time. Right, so at the same time, for example, that Abu Dhabi is, would say that the workers can leave, but Abu Dhabi is also, for example, a leading funder of what they call the Abu Dhabi Actually, dialogue. Actually, it wasn't Abu Dhabi. Where well, in terms of the Abu Dhabi dialogues, they are the, the global migration on, uh, forum on migration is led by Abu Dhabi at the ministerial level. So they are very well aware at the same time of examples, of examples of how to deal with the recruitment issues. The UAE is one of the leading contributors to the UN anti-trafficking effort. And, and so, I mean, one thing that I was going to say about the whole discussion that we're having is that, 
you know, I don't think there's one answer that we're going to find. And what I would hope after leaving this discussion and this evening is, you know, I, I think there were a lot of great points that were raised um, about ways to start tackling this, and, and none of them are, are, are going to address the whole problem, and some of them aren't going to go well. But, you know, I, I love the ideas of thinking about um, licenses and, you know, consequences, integrating what it means to uh, be able to, to keep your license. What are the penalties involved? You know, how do we expand or, or transform um, some, uh, some of those requirements? Um, thinking about, you know, there's this kind of question of, well, what if the client says this? What if the client says that? There is a period of negotiation but hold on, hold when on. you I'm first sorry. enter, uh, I'm you sorry. know, uh, can I just finish? Um, you know, a period of negotiation when you enter a relationship with somebody, you are, you know, go, going to be an architect working with a, a company, you don't just have to, to do what they say. There's a, a negotiation on many issues. And it's that point where you decide that labor rights, the rights of these workers, is going to be a critical element of the negotiation. I think reputational risk is, is an issue. And, uh, you know, I, I know from the part of, of Human Rights Watch, you know, that, that we're going to be thinking about, you know, the, the reputations um, not only of, of those who are kind of directly involved in, in not paying workers, but in all of the different actors who are involved, uh, be, because these don't happen in isolation. So, I mean, I, I think that um, it's just, the other thing is that there are starting to be emerging good practices, and sharing those, um, you know, would be also a great way to start, to say, you know, these things are possible, um, we don't change everything overnight, but let's share some of those good practices. Let's get a core and critical mass of people who are willing to do something. And that's, that's often how a lot of movements really take off. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm gonna interrupt right now. And um, we are out of time for this evening, but I would like to thank everyone for coming tonight. And on behalf of the organizers, I also just wanted to direct your attention to the Who Builds Your Architecture website. Uh, the address there is whobuilds.org. And we hope all of you will visit, but also contribute to the website, which we're developing as an ongoing platform for tackling some of these issues. And as Jordan mentioned, we will also be posting Raphael Sperry's uh, video to the website. So I'd like to thank all of our panelists and our moderator. Thank you.